morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to, um, uh, Glenn talked to us a little bit about statewide and even larger scale um, uh, challenges. I'm gonna bring this back down to the, the urban level and talk a little bit about uh, green stormwater infrastructure and uh, combined sewer overflow. Um, I'm with an organization called Azavia. Uh, Azavia is a software and data analytics uh, company, and we particularly focus on uh, building software and data analytics for social good. Uh, we're what's known as a B Corporation. How many of you have heard of B Corporations? A few of you, all right. Uh, B Corporations are a, a new type of company. The B stands for benefit. Uh, there are about 3,000 of us around the world. Uh, we are for-profit organizations that operate with a social impact mission. Ours is around uh, advancing the state of the art in geospatial technology and then applying it for civic, social, and environmental impact. So our, our work uh, tends to revolve around land, uh, water, and people. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, water today, uh, specifically around stormwater and uh, stormwater bills. I noticed there are some chuckles, uh, not a lot of applause. Uh, I imagine uh, you're all thinking, I came all the way out to California to have this guy talk to me about his water bill for 20 minutes. Uh, I'm gonna try to make the case that your water bill is a very interesting canvas for geodesign. So you can all relax a little bit. I'm gonna, a little bit of a, a greenery there, so um, no longer the water bill. Uh, I imagine that this is uh, perhaps what Philadelphia uh, looked like um, 150, 200 years ago. Uh, Philadelphia uh, had historic streams um, that uh, uh, covered the entire city. Uh, but about, by about 150 years ago, uh, Philadelphia's streams looked like this, and these are approximately the streams that are remaining today. What happened to all of them? They weren't just filled in, the water had to go somewhere. Uh, industrial people, uh, with uh, brick and other materials uh, buried those streams into pipes. And those pipes are still under the ground and ground was filled in and neighborhoods were built over them. Um, then lots of other infrastructure was built up around that. Uh, much of it didn't anticipate the current level of pavement that we have. These were folks who were good engineers but they couldn't predict that cars were going to happen or that we would blanket uh, our cities with, with pavement. Uh, by mid-century, we had a real problem, uh, a minor rainstorm, things were okay, but with all that pavement, uh, we didn't have enough treatment capacity to handle all of that. Uh, and at this time, when most of Philadelphia was built out, the, the stormwater and the, and the sanitary sewer were combined into the same pipes, and so we had uh, what are called combined sewers, and when there was a big rainstorm, the combined sewers would overflow. So uh, here's a little diagram of what that looks like. Combined sewer on the left, uh, separated sewer on the right, 60% uh, of Philadelphia has combined sewers. This is not unusual around the United States, particularly in older cities. Dry weather, it works really well. It takes the water, moves it uh, to the treatment facility. However, when there's wet weather, uh, the excess water overflows into the rivers, and as you can imagine, that creates a real uh, water quality problem. Uh, here's what the Schuylkill River looks like uh, uh, in regular on the left and um, a heavy rainfall on the right. As I said, Philadelphia is not alone. Uh, there are a lot of cities that face these so-called CSO uh, problems. Here's a map of them. Uh, you'll notice a lot are, are the, early, the areas of the country that were settled earliest, uh, in the Midwest and the Northeast. Um, but uh, uh, runoff, stormwater runoff issues are a challenge in many parts of the country. This is the map of the regulated uh, MS4 areas. Represents only about 4% of the US land, but over 80% of the population that face uh, stormwater runoff challenges. The way this gets regulated, as many of you know, at the federal level is through the Clean Water Act. Uh, there's a, a program called the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. It's a permitting system. All of our uh, water agencies have to get a permit from the EPA to operate and discharge uh, water into the rivers. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, most of these cities don't comply with the Clean Water Act. So uh, the EPA has worked with many of them to build uh, a long-term control plan. Uh, Cities have handled this in a number of different ways. Uh, uh, this is a uh, Washington, D.C. This is a neat um, story map that you can find if you search for Washington sewer tunnels. Uh, Washington has a CSO problem uh, up and down its rivers, um, and it is taking a very interesting uh, and I think uh, innovative approach to engineer their way out of this. They're bigging, digging uh, big tunnels under the 
city uh, with these huge uh, boring machines. Uh, this has been going on for a good um, uh, more than 10 years now. Uh, I think these boring machines are fascinating, so I'm just going to keep showing you photos of boring machines. And, um, and they're building these big tunnels. Here's a picture of one of them underneath uh, the city. Uh, and it's a long-term plan. They've got the first tunnel open now in, uh, since 2016, and it's starting to um, operate. They've uh, already removed uh, literally billions of gallons of, of water that would have flowed into the rivers as stormwater flow overflow. This is going to keep going in Washington until 2030 uh, to build out the whole system. Uh, other cities have done this. Portland, Oregon uh, did this uh, earlier. Um, that now about 90% of their city's uh, stormwater surge is handled by these underground tunnels, a similar system. They spent about half a billion dollars uh, building it. Uh, and they've reduced the number of releases in Portland into the Willamette River from about 50 to 100 per year down to 5 to 10 per year. Pretty dramatic improvement. This kind of thing can really work. But here's another picture of Philadelphia, uh, a map of poverty. Uh, the Tourism Bureau, Bureau probably wouldn't want me to tell you this, but this is the poorest big city in America. Uh, it's a really interesting place as well, but the poverty is real. Uh, and Philadelphia, it was felt, really just didn't have the resources to pull off uh, something like this. Um, so uh, back to the water bill. Uh, most of you probably have water bills uh, based on your water meter. Uh, you use a certain number of uh, gallons or, or cubic uh, feet per month, and you get a bill based on that. Uh, this is the way Philadelphia operated as well, and for residential households, continues to do so. Um, however, uh, about uh, 25 years ago, uh, a group called the Stormwater Reallocation Citizens Advisory Council, a little bit of a cumbersome uh, title, but uh, they got together for a few years in the early 1990s and uh, came out with a report that recommended a different approach to reallocate uh, stormwater bills, uh, starting with uh, non-residential properties, not to generate new revenue, be revenue neutral, but start billing people based on the amount of impervious surface that they had on their property, not on the amount of water that they use. Um, this was going to be a pretty big change, particularly for some property owners, and so they proposed phasing this in over uh, several years. So Philadelphia today has two different billing systems, one aimed at residential properties that distributes a stormwater charge per parcel um, uh, based on average uh, impervious surface, and then uh, uh, charges that. But for non-residential properties, um, uh, including uh, large uh, condominiums and things like that, there is a, a gross area charge, that's a dollar amount per uh, square foot, and an impervious area charge, uh, and that's the way you get billed. So here's an example of a property. Um, uh, uh, outlines a gross area charge up at the top, and then uh, based on the impervious area on the, on the property, uh, the bill gets... Uh, charge. So this was put in place uh, starting about 10 years ago now. Uh, as you might expect, some bills go down. If you are a residential apartment building uh, and you're a high-rise tower, you're going to have a very small uh, footprint on the land and your bills, and, but you may use a lot of water, so your bills are very likely to go down quite a bit. Here's in this example from almost $5,000 a month down to $120 a month. Some bills are going to go way up if you are, uh, have a lot of uh, parking lot space and pavement or a large low-rise building, uh, you might see your charge increase quite a bit. And some folks are going to get a big surprise. <laughs> they may have never had a water bill before because they weren't using any water. There's no meter there, uh, but they are nothing but pavement. Um, as you might imagine, uh, a, a number of new data sets was required to pull this off. Um, uh, uh, starting with parcels, uh, a lot of us who work in municipal GIS have, have a lot of familiarity with property parcels. However, the deed records and usual assessment record parcels were not going to be uh, adequate for this, and the water department ended up having to build their own stormwater parcel data set. As you can imagine, water accounts don't always line up with tax accounts and deeds, uh, so they had to build their own and maintain their own parcel data set. Beginning in 1996, they began flying high-resolution uh, aerial photography and then used uh, orthophotos to generate impervious surface uh, maps um, as a starting point and then updated those over time. 
there's some interesting geoprocessing that happens based, uh, using Python and, and uh, SQL and, and um, lots of other things, and uh, use an enterprise geodatabase to, to uh, generate the, the bills based on the impervious surface area and then uh, pass that off to the billing system. Uh, they also uh, imagined that people would want to know about this and think about it uh, as far in advance as possible and developed a series of public uh, web applications that uh, Azavia was uh, fortunate enough to ha have a chance to work on. Um, these allowed you to enter your address if you're a commercial property owner, see what your impervious surface assessment was going to be, and then be able to see how this was going to get phased in, current and then over five years, with a fair amount of detail, as well as an opportunity to uh, apply for um, appeals. So there's a number of different components to this. Uh, you can imagine that when now your bill is going to be based on the amount of impervious surface, property owners get really interested in uh, assessing their actual and measuring their actual impervious surface. So a mechanism was set up whereby they could appeal what the aerial photography showed and be able to um, have it corrected over time. Uh, so a customer support function that's essentially a, a, a GIS-based customer support. Uh, the city also put its money where its mouth was and, and committed to um, uh, a city infrastructure uh, also being uh, redesigned. So every new recreation center or renovation of a, of a school lot or uh, anything else that the city does now incorporates um, some, some pretty sophisticated uh, green stormwater infrastructure components to it uh, and has a stormwater plan uh, for handling water on site. The city also uh, elected to uh, put together an annual budget whereby grants would be given to help people manage uh, stormwater on their site and make changes. So it's not enough to simply change the billing system. That's good. It creates a pricing incentive to change uh, property. But we actually want to, to strengthen that price incentive by giving other kinds of incentives. And so uh, these grants were developed. Uh, uh, the first was called the Stormwater Management Incentive Program, or SMIP. Um, people really exercise their acronym uh, development skills here. The Greened Acres Retrofit Program, or GARP, uh, makes me think that some of these people may have had a previous life at NASA or in the Defense Department, who also love their acronyms. Uh, the city spends about $25 million a year on, um, on these grants uh, and has uh, continued to do this over the course of the of the program. Uh, in addition, uh, we want to incentivize change, and so there needs to be a mechanism whereby if you, if you change how you handle water on your property, you can get credits on your bill. So if you uh, tear up some pavement or plant trees or put a green roof in, that there's a way to get credits on your bill. So the standard for this uh, that was developed in collaboration with the EPA uh, was uh, managing the first inch of runoff uh, on the site, and so there's a credit program uh, for handling that. Uh, in addition, there's a plan review process, so all new construction, whether it is uh, a renovation of an existing site or building a new building, if the ground is disturbed for more than 5,000 square feet, you have to go through a formal uh, stormwater plan review. Uh, this is in addition to zoning and the other kinds of reviews that a, that a, um, a project may go through. And so there's a, a fairly elaborate uh, program set up for, doing, uh, for handling this, um, including a regulatory regime. Now, this uh, stormwater regulatory regime has an interesting characteristic to it. Uh, there's actually a different regulatory system uh, depending on where you are. So the, the stormwater runoff issues are more severe in some sewer sheds than in others. And so the regulations will actually shift based on and the actual process for going through the plan review um, uh, workflow changes based on where you are. So there's a sort of um, uh, geo-enabled uh, regulation. You have to enter your address. It assesses which sewer shed you're in and then channels you into a different uh, plan review workflow based on that. And then finally, the city has altered its zoning code uh, such that if you uh, do green stormwater infrastructure projects on site, and they specifically have to be green, it can't just be uh, a concrete uh, infrastructure, then you can get height and floor area ratio bonuses to increase densi density um, on particular sites, and these are targeted to specific uh, sections of the city as well. All of this together, uh, the city has uh, branded as, as a green city clean waters. Uh, it's a pretty um, uh, uh, 
I think it's been a, a pretty innovative and exciting program uh, to have a chance to work with. But you're at the Geodesign Summit at Esri, so I'm sure you want to see some technology <laughs> and not just water bills. Uh, so I'll walk through a few of the applications uh, we've had a chance to work on. The, the first of these is a second version of that original parcel viewer where people can enter their address, uh, find out what the city thinks their impervious surface is, uh, be able to um, uh, see how the charges are calculated, uh, find more information about how, how measurement is done uh, on properties, um, as well as be able to apply for credits and appeals. Uh, assuming you have applied for a credit and appeal system, there needs to be a back-end infrastructure for city staff to be able to review those, process them, and be able to move them through a workflow and see progress over time, uh, as well as for the property owner to see that sort of information. Um, uh, one of the really uh, uh, interesting applications that I think has a real relevance from a geodesign perspective is something called the Credit Explorer. Uh, property owners can enter their address, um, they can see their property, and then have a chance to actually draw out on the screen, if I put a green roof on this section of the roof, and um, I uh, uh, then put some uh, permeable pavement in another section of my property, and I uh, put, uh, let's say, a, a retention basin in another section, how will that change my bill? Uh, how can I expect to see that uh, bill change first monthly? What's my regular monthly bill? How can I expect it to change? And then what will that look like at one year, two year, five year, uh, 10 year, so I can really see how uh, that return on investment might happen, and then be able to apply for credits or grants uh, in order to uh, pay for that. Uh, this has not quite rolled out yet, uh, uh, but the city is now shifting toward residential properties as well. Uh, there was a small program called um, uh, rain check that enabled you to do things like small scale things like rain gardens. Uh, now they're going to allow residential property owners to lower their bills as well and apply for credits. This is handled a little bit different way. They need to be much uh, smaller scale. The application for this is a little simpler. It still functions based on uh, GIS behind the scenes, but is um, a little bit simpler display. Uh, and then you can sign up to try to get matched with a vendor, uh, a contractor that can that is qualified to do that work uh, on your site. And of course, there's another uh, side of this for the contractors themselves, so they can see who's interested in certain types of um, uh, work to be done on the property. So the contractor can log in, see the different properties that are uh, people have an interest in doing this, um, see some more details, and then uh, be able to contact them. Uh, one of my colleagues has uh, called this Tinder for stormwater projects. <laughs> uh, that somehow was, has not flown with the water department, but it is still our internal <laughs> code word for, uh, for the project. Uh, the water department has uh, thought hard about the next generation as well. This is really long-term thinking. Uh, they understand that some of this is going to require a change in culture, and they have invested in both uh, a water-related uh, uh, museum called the Fairmount Waterworks, as well as a number of other programs to engage young people. Uh, one is a storm drain marker uh, program. So uh, some of you, if you live in cities that have CSO problems, you may have seen these uh, uh, markers that get attached near a storm drain. Uh, Philadelphia has a pretty elaborate one based on uh, the actual sub-watersheds. So uh, there are watershed spirit animals <laughs> uh, that correspond to each one, and they're color-coded and have the animal on them. And um, uh, people are, get pretty excited about this. So. Uh, they're really into it, uh, and they, they don't just, you know, because there's these kits that they get and they have special glues and, and a process for, for putting it down. So there are, there's actually a calendar of events that you can join to put these stormwater markers out. So this application enables you to find events that are scheduled for stormwater marking, search for those, and then uh, it's, it's, this is mobile enabled, so on a, a smartphone you can be out in the street, you can see the area that your event uh, covers, uh, be able to put down your marker, um, um, mark it as marked. Uh, great job. Uh, and then from the city side, be able to actually monitor progress on marking the storm drains across the city. Um, and the last one I'll show you is a, a fishway game. Uh, in some of the rivers, uh, the water department has underwater cameras. And so this is in one of the local museums. You can uh, test your skills identifying fish. Um, 
So uh, meet the fish. Um, and I don't actually have a photo of a fish going by, so you'll just have to imagine there's a fish going by the camera there. And then you uh, have a chance to identify that fish and guess at it and try again and so on, and then learn more about the fish while you're doing this. Great. All right. So this sounds like a great story, right? Uh, green stuff happening, um, innovative billing system, cool uses of GIS, geo-enabled water bills, uh, uh, kids are getting involved, multi-generational thinking, um, uh, all has not gone well. <laughs> Life would be easy except for all the people, right? Um, so remember these folks, some bills are going to go up, and these folks who got a surprise, uh, well, they got pretty aggravated, and as you might imagine, while I don't think the, these uh, uh, business people marched on City Hall, they, they did get in touch with their city council person <laughs> and express their uh, opinion. Uh, the last thing when you are a city staffer that you want to get, well, maybe the last thing you want to hear from is the mayor's office, but the second last thing you want to hear about is a city council person dragging you in front of council to explain yourself. Um, so uh, uh, over the course of um, some fairly uh, aggravating uh, talks between city council and the water department, uh, a new uh, acronym was developed uh, called the Stormwater Custom Customer Assistance Program, essentially for very high impact businesses, particularly warehouse businesses, uh, and this sort of thing where the margins may be slim, but they really have a big impact from uh, the stormwater program. Uh, there's a, a much longer phase-in period. Uh, uh, I think it's more like 10 to 20 years. So um, some customers are getting some extra assistance on this. So all of this has to be paid for. Um, uh, this uh, gets done through a variety of things. I already mentioned a few grants um, and credits. Uh, a lot of this is done by redistributing across all of the other rate payers. Um, this has created some uh, problems, though, uh, that essentially are going to, in the long run, create some potential equity issues. Do you imagine that this is being redistributed across all rate payers and some commercial property owners are getting credits, and the number of credits are increasing over time? Eventually, you're going to have your residential property owners paying for more of the system than the non-residential property owners. And so some long-term assessments have been done around um, uh, what those tipping points look like. And the Water Department really is going to face some issues like this in the next three to five years. Uh, so I think uh, this is a, a, a pretty interesting program. There's a lot here worth uh, taking note of. One is uh, the technology here isn't the hard part. It's building and maintaining the, uh, the actual infrastructure. Uh, the geodesign uh, uh, role here is important, and it's, uh, it's not just the usual uh, 3D and, and game systems that we've seen uh, over the last couple of days, but it can be something as mundane as geo-enabling your water bill uh, and your regulations. Uh, one thing we really benefited from is the opportunity to iterate quite a bit over time, um, uh, and uh, the, the ability to have a 25 or 50 year perspective on how this rolls out is really important. And finally, I think it's important we could denote we could still fail. Uh, this is not easy stuff. Uh, some of it is pretty speculative. Uh, but I'm excited by the potential uh, to have this kind of uh, geodesign technology actually transform a city and make it a more green place to live. Um, thank you all. I really appreciate your attention.